Hello, I'm Catherine Haymans. I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh. I'm director of the German Centre for Cosmological Lensing at the Ruhr University in Bochum, and I'm also um, Astronomer Royal for Scotland. I'm delighted to talk to you today about the different observational probes that we have of how large scale structures evolve in our universe and how we can use those probes to constrain uh, the cosmology of our universe. Um, now, I hope I've got something for everyone in this talk. Um, so uh, the beauty of these virtual seminars uh, is that you can skip ahead to the part of the talk that you are most interested in. Um, so uh, I have got a color bar in the top of my slides uh, to help you uh, find the part of the video that you want to watch. I'm going to start off with a section for the graduate students uh, telling you about all of the different observational traces that we have of the evolution of large scale structures and uh, hopefully convincing you that you should care about all of this. I've got a section for the theorists, uh, the pointed questions that you should be asking large scale structure observers before you trust their results. Tension fans, there's a section for you, uh, a review of the latest hot off the press results from EBOS, Kids and Des, and uh, I'll wrap up, you can watch me getting ultra excited about the new tech that's going to be coming online soon, uh, Desi, Ruben, Euclid and Roman. All right, so let's uh, kick off with this absolutely exquisite image from the cosmic microwave background. Uh, this is the Planck collaboration W map, of course, before it. What you can see in this image is hot spots and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, this is just telling you about the physics of the early universe, where you've got gravity pulling baryons together and radiation pressure pushing things apart again. And you can compress this gorgeous map into a power spectrum. Power spectrum is basically just the number of hot spots and cold spots on different angular scales. Um, the blue data points you can see here have got error bars on them. It is that exquisite a data set. And the red curve that you can see going through it is not a spline fit. It is a theoretical model with only a handful of parameters. And it is just fantastic uh, that it fits the data so perfectly. It tells us exactly how much dark matter, how much dark energy, and how much ordinary matter there is in our universe today. The name of the game for us now as cosmologists is to tell us what is this dark energy and uh, I for one am planning to leave it to my particle physics cousins to tell me what the dark mass particle is. So what's underpinning uh, this red curve that you can see here, this theoretical model, well it's of course Einstein's theory of general relativity. Here we have Einstein's field equations and I've highlighted this lambda term here which is Einstein's cosmological constant. Now, when you derive these field equations, um, this cosmological constant comes about simply from an integral constraint. Um, and so that's not very pleasing. We really want to know what the origin of, of this term is. It, it appears in Einstein's field equations on the, the curvature side of the equations rather than the mass and energy side. But the, the simplest explanation for this cosmological constant is it comes from vacuum energy. Um, but as you will all well know, uh, quantum physics tells us that the energy of a vacuum is significantly higher than uh, what we are measuring for this cosmological constant term. And that's driving us to look for alternative explanations for this dark energy phenomenon. You can broadly fit these theories into two different types of theories. You've got modifications to the left hand side of the equation. These are modified gravity terms, effects that couple to the gravitational potential. And then you've also got sort of more sort of classic dark energy models, quintessence, things like that, uh, which aren't coupled to the gravitational potential, but are affecting the right hand side of this equation. And uh, nearly all of these models will deal with this conundrum of the vacuum energy by simply setting the cosmological constant or the, or the vacuum energy to zero. Now, uh, the supernovae results were, of course, the, the first observational um, constraints that showed that the expansion of our universe was accelerating. Um, but probes like supernovae can only tell us about uh, these sort of dark energy models. They can't tell us anything about if uh, this dark energy is um, to do with, with somehow coupled to gravity. Um, so one of the best probes that you have in order to move forward to understand dark energy those best probes are looking at how large scale structures evolve. Um, now, these large scale structures are evolving in an expanding universe, so you can directly probe the expansion rate of the universe, but they're also evolving under gravity. So you can also test these modification to gravity theories as well. And that's why these new probes are really exciting uh, as we move forward into trying to understand these, uh, this, these dark entities in our universe. 
All right, top probe, in my opinion anyway, is weak gravitational lensing. So the idea here is that you survey uh, huge areas of the sky, you look for very, very distant galaxies. Now the light from these galaxies as they travel towards us from Earth, they're not gonna travel in straight lines, that light is going to be bent, it's gonna be distorted. Um, and uh, what you're gonna see when you see these, these distant galaxies is they're gonna to appear to line up with each other. And that's just because galaxies that are close to each other on the sky, their light is gonna travel through the same large scale structures and it's gonna get bent and distorted in the same way. Um, so what you're looking for with these weak lensing effects is correlations between galaxy shapes. Um, I kind of think of it like sort of dark matters graffitiing the sky, telling you sort of where it is by how um, distorted it makes the shapes of the galaxies behind it. Um, so uh, here's an example, patch of sky. Um, this is a cluster of galaxies at quite low redshift. You can see the cluster. Uh, these are the big yellow galaxies in the foreground. Hopefully you should also see uh, background blue dots. Those are distant galaxies, typically about 7 billion light years away. Their light is going to travel all the way to us. But as that light goes past this uh, over density of um, galaxies in the foreground, the gravitational potential of the matter in that region is going to curve that light. And so the background galaxies are going to be distorted. Um, nobody knows what the dark matter particle is, but I'm quite convinced that uh, uh, if dark matter did have a color, it would be pink. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, this is the clump of dark matter surrounding uh, this galaxy cluster, exactly as you predict from your theories of dark matter. Um, so we can do this sort of measurement across the whole sky. We can do it at different redshifts and we get a picture of how the large scale structures are evolving. Um, there are three different surveys making this measurement right now. Um, I'm co-lead of the Killer Degree Survey. This is a European Southern Observatory public survey. So all of our data and our software and our catalogs, everything is public, go use it. Um, the other two surveys at the moment are the absolutely fantastic dark energy survey and the um, oh, to die for hyper supreme cam survey. This one is particularly exciting. Uh, really wide field camera on uh, Subaru on Mauna Kea. Absolutely gorgeous uh, data set. Um, here is the uh, mass map that we've made for the Killer Degree Survey. This is spanning a thousand square degrees. Um, now what's uh, unique about the Killer Degree Survey is you have colors from the optical all the way through to the near infrared. So if you're wanting to look at how these large scale structures are evolving, you need to know where your galaxies are, where your measurements being made. Um, and to do that, uh, you need photometric redshifts and those photometric redshifts are most accurate when you have the full wavelength coverage from optical all the way through to the near infrared. Um, now, in America, everything is bigger. The cars are bigger, the cans of Cokes are bigger, the burgers are bigger, the mass maps are bigger. Congratulations to my colleagues in the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, it was absolutely so exciting um, to see the uh, year three data release uh, just a month ago now. Here is the absolutely gorgeous mass map. This is spanning 5,000 square degrees. And there's some really, really uh, nice novel techniques that uh, the Dark Energy Survey are using to uh, map from the regions where they do have full wavelength coverage from optical all the way to, through to the near infrared to work out what's happening with their photometric redshifts over the majority of their survey where they have the optical colors. Um, so absolutely a gorgeous mass map there. Um, Hyper Supreme Cam Survey, uh, we've only got their first year data out so far. Check out Aguri et al 2017. Um, everyone is extremely excited about their upcoming data release. Uh, Hyper Supreme Cam Survey is about the same area as the Killer Degree Survey, but significantly deeper. So um, we are all uh, really looking forward to that new result. Okay, uh, those are the mass maps. They're pretty. Uh, we put them in the press, um, but we don't actually do very much science with them so far. So uh, just as we compress the CMB map into a power spectrum, uh, we can compress these mass maps or this, this information into a two-point statistic. Um, so there are loads of different statistics uh, to use, but here's an example of one. Um, what we're looking at here is how aligned the galaxy pairs are as a function of their separation. So when galaxies are close to each other on the sky, their light's going to travel past the same large scale structures. And so they're going to appear to be quite aligned with each other just because their light's been distorted in the same way. Um, but as those galaxies get further apart on the sky, um, then their lights travel past different large scale structures. And so they appear to be less correlated in shape with each other. Um, now, what's really nice about gravitational lensing is uh, you can make a prediction for what you expect to see um, with 
very few astrophysical nasties, although I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit. And the two parameters that we're most sensitive to are omega m, how much dark matter or total matter there is, and sigma 8, how clustered um, those large scale structures are. Now, uh, this is a measurement for just uh, one set of background galaxies at a particular redshift. And what we can do is we can break up our survey into lots of different redshift slices to see how this signal is evolving. Um, and that's what we've got here. This, uh, these are the results from uh, Marie Krasgari. This is the kilodegree survey. Um, exactly the same statistic that I've just shown you how aligned of the galaxy pairs as a function of their separation, but now split up as a function of increasing look back time. And you can see as you go to higher redshift, the signal increases. And that's just because there's been more large scale structure that that light has passed through. So you get a stronger lensing effect. Now, uh, Cosmic shear isn't the only tool that we have at our disposal to look at how these large scale structures are evolving. So we've talked so far about how we can look at how galaxy shapes are correlated and how that gives us uh, this, this, this cosmic shear effect. Um, but there are other probes of the large scale structure. We can look at how the galaxies are clustered within that large scale structure. We can also look at the cross correlation between those two things, so how the background galaxies are being lensed by the foreground galaxies. And these three different measurements, uh, cosmic shear, galaxy clustering, and uh, the correlation between the two, which is known as galaxy-galaxy lensing, the combination of those three together is known as three times two point. Um, so here's an example of galaxy clustering. Uh, this is the BOSS DR12 release. Um, this is a spectroscopic survey. Um, what you're seeing here is the number of galaxy pairs as a function of their separation relative to just a random distribution. So on small scales, you see there are lots of galaxy pairs. That's because they're clustered together within the large scale structure. And as you go out to larger scales, those, the, the number of pairs go down, which is what you'd expect. Um, what you can see is the characteristic bump. That's the baryon acoustic oscillation. That's exactly the same feature that we saw right at the start in that image of the cosmic microwave background, where those baryons are being compressed under gravity and pushed back out again with the radiation pressure. That signal is still imprinted on the galaxy distribution today. And you can see that in the baryon acoustic oscillation peak there, about um, 100, uh, 120 or so megaparsecs. Um, and the different color curves that you can see here are splitting, looking at galaxy pairs across the line of sight, along the line of sight, parallel to line of sight, and, and sort of halfway in between. And you can see there's different amplitude there, and that's because of the redshift space distortion. So um, when you're looking at uh, galaxies separated along the line of sight, um, those measurements are affected by uh, the, the movement in redshift, so the fact that these galaxies are moving. And that provides you even more information about how these large scale structures are growing. Um, here's a, a lovely new result from the DES year three result. This is the galaxy galaxy lensing result, one of the three times two point statistics. Um, what you're looking at here is different combinations of uh, foreground galaxies, those are known as the lenses, and background galaxies, those are the sources. So there's huge, huge amounts of data here to um, compare with different theories. Um, there's more though, you don't just have to use the galaxies. So the cosmic microwave background that we saw right at the start, that's also lensed by the foreground structure. Um, in exactly the same way that our galaxies are lensed, so that those hot spots and cold spots are also lensed. That's called CMB lensing, gives you even more information. Um, and you can also look at clusters. So you don't just have to look at where galaxies are within the large scale structure, you can identify um, clusters and count them as well. That gives you even more information about how these large scale structures are evolving. Um, we do not have enough time today to go through everything. I'll show you a couple of CMB lensing uh, results, but uh, also check out the literature for cluster um, probes of large scale structure, because that's incredibly powerful as well, if you can work out what a cluster is. Okay, uh, so that is our introduction for the graduate students over. We're moving on to things that theorists might want to take on board before they trust the results. Um, now, these uh, results, these probes of the large scale structure, it's not as clean as a CMB measurement, unfortunately. Um, there are lots of steps that we have to take in order to be able to extract information from our data. So we're starting off with high resolution deep imaging data that gives us an object catalog. 
We need to combine that with multiband imaging to give us colors so we know exactly where these objects are. And when I say exactly, we don't know exactly. We have some probability distribution of where we think these objects are with their photometric redshifts. First up, we need to split things into stars and galaxies. Galaxies, of course, are what we're going to be making our measurement with. Stars are really useful because they tell us about all of the distortion effects that have happened as that light makes its last nanosecond journey uh, through our atmosphere, telescope and camera. So we combine the information together from the stars in order to produce a shape measurement. This gamma here is the, the shear measurement um, and also a, a probability distribution for where each object is in, in redshift space. Now, these measurements are difficult to make, so we need to calibrate them and make sure that we've done them right. So um, we use image simulations and null tests to test our shape measurements. So uh, the image simulations are really crucial to make sure that we are accounting for all sorts of things like how galaxies blend together, how they evolve and change with time. Null tests are, are things where we're looking to make sure that what we measure isn't a terrestrial in origin, that these distortions that we're measuring really are cosmological in origin. Um, You've also got to calibrate your redshift. So uh, some form of overlapping spectroscopy is uh, typically used for this. Um, you can look at cross correlations between the photometric redshifts, the spectroscopic redshifts. You can use um, machine learning techniques. There are loads of different methods to calibrate those redshifts. And uh, these two steps here, these calibration steps, are the origin of many, many, many different papers for all the different surveys, because these are key things um, to get right. But once you're sure that you've calibrated your redshifts, you've calibrated your shape measurements, you can pump that information into your favorite statistic. Now there are oodles of different statistics out there. They all do more or less the same thing. The important thing here is that you have a, um, an observable, a prediction for what your statistic should yield um, and also a good error analysis. And people incorporate M-body simulations, uh, <laughs> this way around, analytical halo models um, to, uh, to predict what they expect to observe. You pump that all into your likelihood analysis, then there are all the nuisance parameters, and eventually you get your cosmology out. Lots and lots of steps there. Um, in order to trust the cosmology, you need to be sure that all of these steps have been done. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on those nuisance parameters uh, for this uh, theorist audience, because this is uh, where the observers really need more help from our uh, theoretical arm of the cosmology gang. Um, intrinsic galaxy alignments. OK, so um, you are looking when you're looking at cosmic shear, you're looking for the distortion of galaxies caused by um, caused by the light as it travels through the universe, okay? Um, but we know when galaxies form in the same environment, they tend to line up with each other. Now we have models for this. We account for our uncertainty on these models in our observations, but at some point, our, our lack of knowledge about intrinsic galaxy alignments is going to be uh, dominant. And no matter how much more data we get, it doesn't really matter because we're gonna be swamped by our uncertainty on how galaxies um, form and evolve and how their shapes are intrinsically correlated with each other. Uh, so that's a really important area that we need to learn more about. Barry on feedback, uh, everything we're measuring really in these surveys comes from the nonlinear regime. Um, so if you want to limit yourself just to the linear regime, you, you, you have very little signal to noise left. The power is in the nonlinear regime. We are often comparing our data to M-body simulations of how um, structures uh, collapse in this nonlinear regime. Um, but we know that galaxies have very powerful AGN at their core, which have a feedback mechanism, which, which change the total matter distribution. This is known as baryon feedback. We have to account for this in our observations. We have models and methods to do this. Uh, but uh, again, this is potentially a limiting factor. So we're relying heavily on hydrodynamical simulations now to inform us about how much of an effect uh, baryon feedback is on our measurements. Galaxy bias. Now, this only affects the galaxy clustering measurements, but it's really important. So we know that uh, red galaxies are more strongly clustered than blue galaxies. This is just because the galaxies are biased. At the moment, most of our measurements are, uh, um, are, are using linear bias models. We know that galaxies don't are linearly biased. They have non-linear bias, but we don't have good models to account for that. And that's limiting how much data uh, we can use. So we need 
advances in that area as well. But all of the results that I'm about to show you, they do account for all of these effects. Uh, the error budget includes our uncertainty on all of these nuisance parameters, these astrophysical uncertainties. Um, and uh, these aren't the dominant effects right now for the surveys that we're looking at, but they will be in the future um, if we don't invest uh, more time and thought into how to really deal with these astrophysical um, effects in order to extract the uh, core cosmological information that we're interested in. All right, tension fans, it is now time for you to tune in uh, to the talk. Uh, we're going to start with a little trip down memory lane. Uh, this is the Canada France Hawaii Telescope Lensing Survey. Uh, we still win the Best Dressed Team Award. <laughs> Um, this is a very old photo. Uh, CFHT lens was the first wide field wheat lensing survey. Um, as I said at the start, you are mainly constraining sigma 8 and omega m with wheat lensing uh, constraints. And our first results came out before the Planck um, constraints. And here is um, uh, an analysis here where we're comparing these old results to Planck. And you can see tension. Tension is the big word in cosmology at the moment. So the Planck constraints in grey are uh, higher than what we were measuring with CFHT lens. And at the time, we were simply told that we must be doing something wrong. Uh, fair enough, it was the first time that we had made this sort of measurement. We have certainly learned a lot since 2013 about how to make these measurements. But what is really interesting is that this tension persists. Um, when we were gearing up for the kilo degree survey, um, I was very conscious that I really wanted to agree with Planck. <laughs> Um, so um, Conrad Koikin, Sarah Bridal and I came up with a scheme to blind our data and I'm very, very happy that uh, now this is absolutely standard in our field that we blind our analyses. Um, it's really important that the result that we get out has not been influenced by any conscious or unconscious biases um, that we may have. Um, this is the, where we were uh, about three weeks before we published um, from the Killer Degree Survey. Um, we had one data set, which was the truth, uh, two data sets that were modified to uh, in, enhance or exacerbate this uh, tension that we see with Planck. Um, we didn't know which one of these ones were the truth. We analyzed it all the way to the end. Uh, we unblinded and uh, published a couple of weeks uh, later. Um, the, uh, what we found with the Killer Degree Survey uh, was a three sigma tension uh, between our measurements of the uh, clustering of dark matter at low redshift compared to what you predict from the Planck CMB measurements. And so uh, we were all super excited uh, to see what would happen with the dark energy survey, that 5,000 square degrees. Um, so uh, I've, I've picked, there are lots of different papers uh, for you to look at from the dark energy survey, but I picked this plot from um, Alexandra Amon's uh, cosmic shear paper. Um, so on the left, you can see the cosmic shear results from the Kilo degree survey, on the right from the dark energy survey. Um, now, there are lots of different contours here, and that's because we can make different choices. So that cosmology recipe that I took you through, um, there are different choices that you can make. Uh, the kids' uh, image here is highlighting different choices of statistics that you can make. Uh, the DES one here is highlighting different choices that you can make on which scales you want to use um, for your analysis. One thing that might be jumping out at you at the moment, however, is the very difference between the Planck constraints on this plot. Um, so on the, uh, the kids plot, the Ascari et al plot, uh, you can see the Planck constraints in sigma 8 and omega m are very tight. This is the fiducial Planck analysis. Um, now, DES has chosen to um, relax some of the priors in that analysis. Um, specifically, um, they do not fix the neutrino mass. And actually, the neutri if you uh, don't include that informative prior of the value of the neutrino mass, then the Planck constraints become weaker in this sigma eight omega m space. Um, now, uh, I'm not a member of DES, so I don't have access um, to this data, but with the power of, of PDFs and PowerPoint, we can still combine the data, hooray. <laughs> so um, thanks very much for to Tillman Tritster for uh, giving me these slides. So I'm just gonna take the fiducial analysis. Um, I could combine any or all of them, but I'm just gonna stick with the fiducial analysis from both teams. Um, here we go. And we can um, combine them together with the power of PowerPoint, hooray. Whew. They perfectly overlap with each other. Uh, possibly too good to be true. Um, caution here, very different prior choices. So the length of the banana you can see here differs between kids and dares. That's just the choice of priors that has um, been used um, 
to, to do this analysis. Um, but you can see that the width of the banana is, is, is exactly the same. They agree incredibly well with each other. Um, and that's possibly <laughs> surprising, given that we had quite different choices about how we dealt with the intrinsic alignments, the baryon feedback, and um, different ways to model the nonlinear power spectrum. Um, so really interesting uh, results there. And I'm really excited that we are starting to work together now to do a full combined analysis of these two surveys um, together. Okay, uh, so this is uh, an annotated version from um, Alexandra Amon's uh, paper here. Uh, now you can see here the days year three optimized results. So that's slightly different from their fiducial results, got tighter um, error bars there. Um, and you can see there that compared to CFHT lens, uh, kids and the year one results from the Hyper Supreme Cam survey. And uh, if I move a little bit this way, <laughs> you can compare that to uh, the two plant constraints, depending on your choice of informative priors uh, about neutrinos. And, and what I want you to take away from this plot is that all of these wheat lensing surveys are on the low side um, for this combined parameter S8, which is a combination of sigma-8 and omega m. Tension, huh, how do you define tension? So uh, lots of discussion on this in the literature, but you know, two to three sigma tension here and the fact that all of them are on the low side. All right, uh, so uh, it's not just cosmic shear. There are lots of different probes of the large scale structure. Uh, this is a nice new figure from Arthur Luiero, um, where he has looked at the new EBOS uh, results as well. Um, so this is again the sigma eight omega m plane um, in uh, red and yellow, different two point statistics again for the kilo degree survey cosmic shear constraints. In blue, these are the constraints from uh, the DR16 EBOS results. In green, Planck, the fiducial analysis with a fixed neutrino mass. Uh, in purple, and um, this is the combined cosmic shear with uh, these uh, DR16 results. And in dash black, you can see the full uh, three times two point analysis from kids. Um, again, on that low side, uh, there's some tension there. Um, Eagle eyed EBOS. Uh, uh, people will be looking at that and going, hang on a minute, those blue contours don't look like the ones we published. Sure enough, they don't. Uh, so these, this is the uh, paper from, uh, from the DR16 result, Alan Mattel. Um, the red contours you can see here are DES year one, um, but the blue is exactly the same data set and different prior choices. Okay, so this is something we're gonna need to talk about as a cosmology community. What do we want to use as priors? Okay, we can use informative priors. So for example, fixing the neutrino mass, that's an informative prior. Um, or we can say, actually, I don't want any informative priors at all. I want to know what these surveys do on their own. Um, the EBOS chose to use quite tight priors on NS and omega, M, omega B. Um, in this analysis by Arthur Luiero, those uh, priors are, are loosened to be consistent with the priors we've chosen for kids. And it does make a difference in the results. And you can argue which one's right or wrong. So it really depends on your choice of how informative do you want your priors to be. Um, but interesting, we're still uh, we're seeing that tension um, there. Uh, right, CMB lensing. I uh, said we'd talk a little bit about that. Um, so that's using an extra background source to measure the lensing. Um, on the left hand side of the plot, you can see the uh, combined kids with uh, CMB lensing uh, results. On the right, this is the DES year three result and uh, uh, the left plot comes from a paper from Tilman Trutster and the right hand plot comes from the DES collaboration. I found this gorgeous picture of all of them all together. <laughs> um, what's great about CMB lensing is it breaks these degeneracies that you can see in this, this sort of banana shape. So it's really good to combine the CMB lensing in there. It gives you really nice tight constraints and you can see this behavior both in kids and DES, um, the yellow constraint in, uh, on the left-hand plot is the full three times two point plus the CMB lensing. Again, sort of a three sigma tension with kids. Um, now, the DES results, um, you've, uh, you've got the CMB lensing there. Um, again, eagle-eyed people will be saying, well, hang on, why aren't they the same in both plots? It's the same Planck CMB lensing measurement, different choices of prior again. So it's something that we need to think about as a community. And in gray, now this is the first time I'm showing you the DES three times two point result. Now um, in kids, we've always used spectroscopic data so far to do our three times two point. And um, DES here, they are using their photometric sample 
they've got different samples that they can use um, to do that. This is a, a magnitude limited sample. And that pushes them up um, just a little bit. So in the full three times two point analysis, uh, DES is perfectly consistent with Planck. And let me just guide you around this, this uh, slightly noisy plot. You have seen uh, the yellow dashed black, blue and gray contours already. Uh, that's a combination of kids, DES, cosmic shear or three times two point. Um, the purple results you haven't seen yet, these are the HSC year one results. Now, these uh, both the dashed and the solid lines are analysis of exactly the same data set, but with different statistics. And they get different, slightly different results. This is exactly what we'd expect for a survey at the size that HSC is when, when they did this analysis. So still quite noisy data. So let's wait and see um, what happens with the next uh, data release from HSC. And uh, those green contours there from Planck, again, are slightly larger than um, you're used to seeing in the, in the kids plots. But again, that's that neutrino um, prior being weakened. Um, so there's year three, it's three times two point result, perfectly consistent with Planck, perfectly consistent with kids and HSC and, and everything. And really excited to see what happens with there's year six when they go to full depth. Um, you're going to see those error bars uh, shrinking. It's going to be really interesting to see what they find. And what we're doing with kids now um, is going to higher redshift. So that near infrared coverage across our full survey allows us to push to even higher redshifts. Um, and that's what we're working on at the moment, how to calibrate those uh, high redshift galaxies. All right, so where are we at? Uh, so there's three times two point, perfectly consistent with Planck. There's cosmic shear on the low side. Looking at the other cosmic shear surveys, always on the low side, what does it actually mean? So if we are looking at the CMB, we can use a flat lambda CDM model to tell us what the universe looks like today. And uh, what we're seeing when we compare it to our direct measurements is that our universe is uh, smoother than we'd expect from the CMB measurements. And it's expanding too fast when we throw in the, the Hubble uh, direct measurements as well. And that goes in exactly the same direction. If our universe is expanding faster than we'd expect from the CMB measurements, we'd also expect the large scale structures to be smoother. They, they haven't had uh, as much time to, to collapse under gravity. So they're going in, uh, in the same direction. What could explain this? So do we need to go beyond uh, flat lambda CDM in order to explain this? So uh, there are various just different papers on this. I'm just going to show you some results from um, Tillman Trutster's paper, Trutster et al. Um, for the uh, cosmology aficionados, I've put the full data cube here. You can pause the video um, to uh, pull out whatever you want from this plot. Um, for those of you who uh, just want to look at this question of tension, uh, you can just look at the pink box that I've highlighted at the top there. And uh, what you want is the plank uh, in grey and the three times two point result in yellow. You want them to overlap. This cosmology, we've allowed the dark energy to have a different equation of state than the cosmological constant. So that's a, a, a WCDM model, doesn't solve the tension. Um, here we're releasing the flatness constraint. So it's still lambda CDM, but it's no longer a flat cosmology. Again, doesn't solve the tension. Um, here we are varying the neutrino mass. So um, you can see that the Planck constraints grow a little. Um, that helps a little bit to resolve the tension just because it makes the Planck less constraining, but it's still, the tension's still there with kids. Um, and uh, those modified gravity scenarios. So it's actually really hard to analyze the CMB with a modified gravity scenario, but here we've got um, an F of R uh, analysis of the cosmic shear signal. Uh, it doesn't change, uh, doesn't change the results. Um, this is quite an interesting analysis because we're going to the nonlinear regime um, using a, a halo model reaction approach to model the um, F of R cosmology. So um, have a look at papers by uh, Matteo Cataneo et al uh, for, for that modeling. So a um, bit of a quandary really where we're going. Is this tension real? There's no obvious theoretical model that could explain it. Um, so what we need is more data. And here's where I start getting really excited. Uh, I'm so pleased for my colleagues in the dark energy spectroscopic instrument that they are now in full survey operations. Um, if we see how much science has come out of BOSS and EBOSS it's, you know, and SGSS, it's just been fantastic. So so excited to see what's going to come out of DESI, uh, pushing those uh, spectroscopic maps of galaxies in our universe out to really high redshift. This is going to be um, a phenomenal survey. Um, 
the Aruban Observatory, here is a picture of it back in uh, May 2019. Uh, here is it just a couple of months ago, it's so almost ready. Um, we're about a year behind schedule because of uh, uh, COVID restrictions, uh, closing down the construction on the site, but uh, we will be entering full survey observations in October 2023. I am so excited of what we're going to be able to do with this Rubin data. Um, it's going to be like uh, HSD data across the entire night sky. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous, super deep uh, data. Um, and of course, uh, we're not just going to be doing these sort of measurements from the ground. Uh, here is uh, some ground based imaging. Here we are in space. Uh, life is much easier if you're trying to make these, these wheat lensing measurements if you're going up in space. So we have not one but two uh, instruments about to be launched. Euclid is going to be launched at uh, end of 2022, 2023, and also the Nancy Grace Roman um, Telescope as well. Um, to be honest, all of these instruments aren't really going to work on their own. They're going to have to work in tandem. Euclid needs the colours from uh, Rubin. Rubin needs some information from Euclid to work out what galaxies are uh, individual galaxies and, and what are blends. Um, but these data sets are going to be absolutely exquisite. Um, and we are going to be able to make those dark matter maps across the whole night sky. Uh, and we're going to be able to really probe these different theories about dark energy. But we're not ready for these surveys yet we at some point we're going to be really limited by systematics so we need work on the intrinsic galaxy alignment how do we model nonlinear galaxy bias um, so much information for us is in the nonlinear regime and so we need good models of galaxy bias in order to really extract information in that regime um, the nonlinear matter power spectrum. So at the moment, we've got a really great program to, to accurately map this in a flat lambda CDM. But if these tension results are right, then we need to be going beyond flat lambda CDM. How do we make these um, predictions in the nonlinear regime for exotic models? We really need development in that. And then, of course, there's lots of work still to do in calibrating our data. Uh, the joint shear and redshift calibration needs work on object selection bias. There's work to be done for these new instruments that are coming up online. Um, so I am going to leave it there. Um, at the start, I said, why were we doing this? It was because we want to know if Einstein's cosmological constant is, is the right theory. So it fits that CMB data gloriously. Can it explain the evolution of large scale structures to the present day. If you trust these tension results that we're currently seeing, uh, they're very significant in the Hubble tension, less significant in, in these uh, large scale structure constraints. But if you trust them, then you should be looking for a new theoretical model already because flat lambda CDM can't explain what, what we're seeing. Um, but more data, let's see if these results persist. Um, Euclid Rubin, you're going to be seeing those first results coming out really high precision, I'd say 2025. Um, so if Lambda CDM is slightly wrong, you're going to know about it by then. Uh, you should have really concrete results from those two experiments in, in the not so distant future. Um, now, many dark energy and modified gravity theories look just like a cosmological constant. So in some ways, we might never know. But this tension results, if they persist, uh, indicative of maybe something quite different being there. And I'm really fascinated to see how this moves forward, what different theories can be derived and developed in order to explain this difference between the high redshift universe and the low redshift universe. So um, I will leave you there. Thank you so much for listening to this talk. Um, graduate students, one more slide for you. Uh, there's a book, you can read it. <laughs> um, just Google my name, Heyman Stark University. It's a free book. It was written for, uh, for you um, to get a sense of all of these different probes that we have um, of the dark universe. Um, and I look forward to uh, talking to everyone at the Cosmology at Home conference um, in the live Q&A session uh, later on this week.